Welcome to another in our series of seminars that are trying to help you answer life's big questions. This is session four, in which we are continuing to answer the question, is the Bible a message from a God I can't see, by looking at a law ahead of its time. This section will show you that a system of law given to the early Israelites was thousands of years ahead of its time. Compared with the practices of other nations at the time, the Bible's advice on community health was remarkable. It wasn't until the 19th century that most European countries discovered and adopted ideas found in this law, which was given thousands of years earlier. There are parts of this civil law which are even ahead of our time. We shall look at some recommendations which would reduce the problems we have in our world at the moment. The idea of preventing disease is a relatively recent one. This is shown by the fact that the very first medical officer of health in Britain was appointed in Liverpool in 1847, less than 200 years ago. Community health is now taken very seriously, but the law of Moses was concerned with community health 3,500 years ago. Community medicine is concerned, amongst other things, with guidance on the food we eat, disposal of waste and control of disease. We shall see that in all three areas, the laws given to Israel in the Bible are not only accurate, but far ahead of their time. Today, we are going to look at the law of Moses and how many of its instructions fit in with our current understanding of simple ways to avoid food poisoning, contamination, disease and particularly the spread of contagious diseases. So the Bible has a good food guide. The law of Moses placed no restriction on eating fruits or vegetables. There were, however, strict restrictions on eating the flesh of animals. Animals that were unclean were not to be eaten. There were hundreds or thousands of species of animals around in Moses' time that people could eat. But the law restricted the Jews to eating only a small number. The amazing thing is that nearly 3,500 years later, experience and science have led us to the same conclusions. Under the law of Moses, only certain types of flesh could be eaten. These restrictions we will look at applied to the meat of animals, mostly mammals, also at fish and birds. There were also instructions about some things connected with meat, fat and blood. So let's look at these subjects in order. The meat of animals or mammals. Leviticus chapter 11 lays down the basic principle of deciding whether animals can be eaten. In Leviticus chapter 11 verse 3 we read, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, and chewing the cud, that you may eat. So you'll see in the notes that there are pictures of sheep and cows. They were permitted foods. The people of Israel could only eat meat from animals which had cloven hoofs and which also chewed the cud. This meant that sheep, cows and deer could all be eaten. Interestingly, this rule excludes pigs and all meat-eating animals. With the exception then of pigs which don't chew the cud, we generally follow the same basic rules today. Most of the time now, we can safely eat pig meat in many countries because strict regulations protect us from becoming involved in the life cycle of the pig tapeworm or the pig roundworm. If people eat raw or undercooked pork or bacon containing the larvae of the tapeworm or roundworm, they can suffer the results, which can include blindness, paralysis, epilepsy or even death. Pigs also transmit a number of other infections, including the well-known Salmonella bacteria. An even more serious infectious disease known as pig bell is sometimes seen in the highlands of New Guinea following ritual pig kills and feasting on pork. So, a law ahead of its time. 
In summary, the law of Moses prohibited eating of unsafe meat, and it permitted eating of meat we are now confident will be safe. Let's look at fish. Leviticus chapter 11 verses 9 and 10 give the guidelines. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, they are an abomination to you. So then we have a picture in the notes, a picture of cod, permitted food. It had fins and scales. Of all the animals living in water, only fish with fins and scales could be eaten. This excludes all other aquatic animals, including shellfish and crabs. Most seafood poisoning today comes from eating shellfish and crustaceans, shrimps, crabs and lobsters, which were forbidden under the law of Moses. If we look closely at these animals, we can understand why. Their favourite habitats are shallow, tidal rivers and estuaries, where they survive by filtering out suspended organic matter. This will often include products of sewage outfalls, which contaminate the shellfish with bacteria and viruses, causing dysentery, typhoid and hepatitis. Shellfish grown in cool water passed through filtration tanks are safer, but viruses cannot easily be filtered out, so the restriction of the law of Moses is still the best guide. Bacteria and viruses are killed by thorough cooking, but shellfish poisoning can also come from other sources, for example heavy metals or poisons and similar. So crabs, as shown in the picture, are not permitted. Crabs, crayfish, shrimps, they were all unclean. It is now known that they transmit several different species of lung flukes, which are parasites that live in our lungs. Again, it is safer to follow the regulations of the law of Moses. It was a law ahead of its time. The law of Moses permitted eating only fish with fins and scales. It prohibited eating fish we now know can be harmful. Let's now look at birds. And again we find the guidelines in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 13 to 19, which say, These are the birds you are to detest and not eat because they are detestable. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, any kind of black kite, any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoopoe and the bat. Now some of these birds are difficult to identify precisely and different translations will refer to different birds in the list. But it is clear that these forbidden birds are carnivorous or carrion eating. Once again, this is the accepted standard today. We do not eat birds such as vultures, but we do eat the birds which are mainly vegetarian, such as chickens and turkeys. Once again, the law of Moses, a law ahead of its time. It permitted eating of grain-eating birds. It prohibited eating of carnivorous birds. Now let's look at a couple of subjects that are related to meat and what we might eat. So, fat. The regulations God gave Moses were very clear about eating fat. In Leviticus chapter 7 verse 23, we read, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You shall not eat any fat of ox or sheep or goat. When we look at the guilt or trespass offering described in the same chapter, it tells us about what should be done with the fat from the offering. In Leviticus chapter 7 verses 3 to 5, The fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. 
and the priest shall burn them. This prohibition of animal fat, especially abdominal fat, is interesting. This fat from which suet and tallow are made is highly saturated and eating it is unhealthy. It is notable that the unsaturated fat of fish and vegetable oils is not mentioned here. Again, the law given by Moses was ahead of its time. Modern medical science is now caught up and gives the advice that we should eat unsaturated vegetable oils and fish rather than saturated animal fats. So, the law of Moses, which was a law ahead of its time, recommended no animal fat be eaten, but there was no restriction on fish and vegetable fat. Let's move on now to water supply and waste disposal. The Bible Guide to Water Supplies The law of Moses shows the care that had to be taken to ensure that water supplies were pure. If a dead animal was found in a container, the water could not be used. After listing the animals that could not be eaten, the law said in Leviticus chapter 11 verses 32 to 36, Anything on which any of them falls, when they are dead, shall be unclean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. Any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. So if you look at the picture of the dirty puddle in the notes, it reminds us that dirty, stagnant water was forbidden by the law of Moses. This would mean that if a dead animal was found in a container of drinking water, the container should be either washed or destroyed. But notice that this does not apply to flowing water in a river or spring, where the risk of disease is much less than in stagnant water. The water in such things could be used, but anything touching the carcass was actually regarded as unclean. There is another interesting fact to note from this verse. It says that an earthen drinking vessel must be smashed when a dead animal is found in it. This would mean that they were not to drink from a clay pot which had a dead creature in it. There is no mention, however, of destroying vessels made of wood in similar circumstances. Scientists now know that wood has antibacterial properties, so it only needs to be rinsed to make it safe after being in contact with a dead animal. We shall see more of this contrast between earthen and wooden pots a little later. Yet again, we can see that the law of Moses was ahead of its time. Stagnant water containing dead animals was not to be drunk. Drinking water could be taken from a flowing stream, even though the stream might have dead animals in it. Earthen pots were to be destroyed after contact with a dead animal, but no similar restriction was made on wooden pots. Now let's look at the Bible Guide to Sewage Disposal, because the Bible is right up to date on this subject as well. We build treatment works, like the picture of the treatment plant in the notes, to process our sewage and make it safe. But before such treatment plants were developed, it was wise to follow the advice of the law of Moses and bury sewage away from habitation. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 12 and 13, we read, Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. Typhoid fever and dysentery have been the downfall of many armies in the field because this advice was not heeded. It was not until the 1914 to 1918 war that it was realised that sewage left lying around in the camp 
affected the water supply. It also attracted flies, which then infected food. By contrast, the Talmud, which was the Jewish civil law based on the law of Moses, upheld modern standards of public hygiene back in the first century. The Talmud would not allow rubbish heaps and dung hills inside cities like Jerusalem. Fires were kept burning in the Valley of Hinnom, just outside Jerusalem, as a kind of public incinerator. This was by far the best way of controlling flyborne infections and was of great value to public health. So once again, a law ahead of its time. Sewage had to be buried away from habitation. Now let's look at disease control. Particularly, we'll start with infectious discharges. The law of Moses had strict guidelines regarding conditions giving rise to any form of bodily discharge. So in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 1 to 12, we read this, and this is a quick summary. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. Every bed is unclean on which he who has the discharge lies, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. He who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And he who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. If he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. The vessel of earth that he who has the discharge touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. So in these verses there are several up-to-date principles of public hygiene. Firstly, all discharges were regarded as unclean. Secondly, the person having the discharge was also unclean. Thirdly, anything he came into contact with was unclean. Fourthly, anyone spat upon by a person who was unclean was made unclean. And fifthly, contaminated earthen vessels were to be destroyed but wooden vessels could be rinsed in water. And that's also connected with what we looked at earlier, the distinction between earthenware vessels and wooden vessels. It is only relatively recently that we have learned that disease is spread by contact with discharges and from spitting. So once more, we see that the law of Moses was a law ahead of its time. All contact with bodily discharges required washing. Being spat upon required washing. Contaminated earthenware pots were to be destroyed. Contaminated wooden vessels could be rinsed. The law of Moses also required washing after handling of dead bodies. So in Numbers chapter 19 verses 11 and 12 we read, He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, then he will be clean. Now washing now is a vital part of modern hygiene. And Moses told the Jews that after they had handled a dead body, they had to be quarantined for seven days and then undergo an elaborate washing procedure afterwards. Until about a hundred years ago, surgeons used to handle the dead and the dying and then go straight into the operating theatre without washing. Many of their patients died of infections. These might have lived if early surgeons had kept this principle from the law of Moses. Nowadays, Healthcare workers are aware of the risk of cross-infection between patients. 
They wash their hands frequently and wear protective clothing, such as disposable sterile gloves and theatre gowns. So under the law of Moses, washing was required after handling dead bodies. There was also a requirement for isolation of infectious diseases. In Leviticus chapter 13 verses 4 to 6 we read, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp. So lepers were commanded to live separately from the rest of the people. The biblical term leprosy includes a whole group of infectious diseases. The modern practice of isolating those suffering from infectious diseases was derived directly from the Jews. Leviticus chapter 13 verses 45 and 46 say, The priest shall isolate the one who has the sore seven days, and the priest shall examine him on the seventh day. And indeed, if the sore appears to be as it was, and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him another seven days. Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. The law of Moses also recommended, in fact it commanded, what we now know as quarantine, which involves isolation and re-examination to confirm the diagnosis in doubtful cases. So under the law of Moses, people with infectious diseases had to be isolated and quarantine was required for doubtful cases. We have seen that the law of Moses given 3,500 years ago incorporates many aspects of modern public health which have only been rediscovered in the recent past. We can conclude that the intelligence behind the law given to Moses was from a being with knowledge far ahead of the civilization of those days. So what can we learn from the law of Moses? Was it given just to protect from disease? Let's look at a few verses before we finish. These verses in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and in them God explains why he gave laws to the people of Israel. We've looked at some of them in this session and we'll look at a few others now. There were many others also that relate to behaviour, worship, faithfulness and many other aspects of life. The law was not given so that we could now look at it and say how clever Instead, it was given to control the life and the community of a nation. Exodus chapter 15 verses 25 and 26 tell us, There the law made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. So one of the results of keeping the law would be a reduction of disease. Now we know that some of the reason for that is in the laws themselves, and the rest would come through a blessing from God. A very similar thing is said later, just before the death of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 12 to 15 we read, And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your livestock, and the Lord will take away from you all sickness, 
and none of the evil diseases of Egypt which you knew will he inflict on you, but he will lay them on all who hate you. Once again, keeping the law would bring amazing blessings. Some would be the health benefits we have looked at already. Others would be the benefits of sexual health that come from obeying the sexual laws given in the law of Moses. Others were promised as specific blessings from God, the God who claims to have written the Bible. This is a God whom we can't see, but who has given us evidence in the law of Moses that he is the author of the Bible.